Welcome everyone. Hello, hello. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to hold off for a few seconds while our platform's letting everyone in. In the meantime, feel free to go to the chat box, say hello, give us a greeting, and let us know where you're tuning in from today. We would love to hear from you. We'll get started in just a minute here. Welcome. Oh, I love to see those numbers growing. Hello, welcome. Please feel free to post in the chat. I see some coming through where you're coming from today. Give us a greeting. Hello. Hi, Nikki. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Amy. Oh, it's awesome to see everyone. Welcome. Well, thank you all for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and get started because we have a lot of great discussion to be had this afternoon. Um, thank you and welcome to today's webinar, Where Do I Fit In? Creating Spaces Where Youth Feel Connected. My name is Jackie Zimmerman. I'm the Public Education Associate at Mental Health America's National Office, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I have just a few notes for you all before we get started. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be emailed out to all registrants within one week. We currently do not offer CEUs, but we do offer a certificate of attendance. You can fill that out if you would like a certificate. That link will be posted in the chat here shortly, and it will also come in your follow-up materials. This discussion today will be panel style, so we'll be going through um, a variety of topics with our panelists, but please feel free to ask any questions you might have in the chat, and if we do have time today, then we'll go through some of those at the end. And this webinar is our last in our Back to School series that's really focused on youth mental health. Just a reminder that you can download our Back to School 2022 toolkit, all the fields on our website. I will also post the link to that here shortly. And now I'm very excited to welcome our speakers for this session. We have four wonderful panelists with us today that do some really great work and are advocates for mental health um, all across the US. So today with us, we have Marcus Alston, who is the founder and executive director for Alston Athletes. We have Irene Hu, who is a Team Acoma member, along with Anya Beltran, who is also a Team Acoma member. And we have Sin Gomez, who is the ASUCQT Plus Wellness Director and a student at the University of California, Berkeley, along with many other endeavors. But welcome panelists. We're so thrilled to have each of you here with us today. Um, we have a group of individuals that have a variety of backgrounds and perspectives. Some advocates for youth mental health, others who are working in professional positions supporting young people's mental health. So before we dive too deep into our discussion for today, I would love for each of you just to introduce yourself and give our audience a little insight as to who you are. I can go first. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sin. I use he and they pronouns. I've been working with Mental Health America pretty much since I was in high school. Um, I started my work in mental health um, as a vice president of my high school's NAMI. Um, I then became a Mental Health America Youth Leadership Council member with Marcus. And um, recently, I became a rare, rare beauty, rare impact ambassador, um, br like bridging beauty and like mental wellness into the same conversation. Aside from that, I do um, work within my university to try to make sure wellness is at the forefront of an institution um, that is very rigorous and um, very focused on, um, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, and at the same time, research and being at the cutting edge of innovation. So balancing all of these different things at the same time really makes me want to take an intersectional approach to mental health, um, as well as my various identities. So I'm happy to be here with y'all. And yeah, welcome to hear from everyone else too. Hello, everyone. My name is Marcus Alston. I'm the founder and executive director of Alston for Athletes. I've been a mental health advocate for about three years now. Um, I've served on councils uh, with SIN, with uh, the Young Mental Health Leaders Council with MHA. Um, I currently serve on the board of directors for NAMI Maryland, where we oversee all the county affiliates across the state. 
Um, and I recently just wrapped up uh, the uh, Mental Health Youth Action Forum uh, with MTV in the White House. Hi, my name is Irene, and I am a junior at Washington Liberty High School. Um, I am also a youth ambassador of the Acoma Mental Health Project. And I was born and raised in China and moved to Thailand. And then I came to the US when I was in seventh grade. And I'm really happy to participate in this event. Hi, my name is Anya. And I graduated high school early 2021. I'm currently a cosmetology student at Aveda in the Virginia area. And I'm also a youth ambassador with Irene for the Acoma Project as well. Wonderful. Thank you all for being here today. It's so great to hear your different backgrounds, experiences, and I'm so excited to, to dive a little deeper with each of you. And just want to say a thank you and congratulations for all the work you are doing. Some of those things that you had mentioned are even new for me to learn about you. I know that all doing really, really great things. So um, it's inspiring that we have such um, youth that are engaged and active and wanting to further this type of work. And so just to get started on our discussion here today, one of the topics that we had explored in our back to school toolkit is youth having a place where they feel connected or maybe feeling like they don't fit in. And that's so hard for so many people of feeling like, where, where do I fit in? Where do I have that sense of belonging and that sense of connection? And it gets increasingly hard, especially post pandemic. And even while we're still dealing with the pandemic, uh, that social aspect of life being taken away for a while and that being a struggle for young people. Um, just to start us off, what are some of the biggest challenges that young people face when it comes to feeling like they fit in or belong? Have you seen or maybe experienced any of this yourself affect mental health? And what does that look like? I can start us off. Um, for me, throughout high school and arguably like my first semester in college, um, I'm one of the kids that graduated and started college throughout um, COVID. Um, and I think that the two biggest things that consistently like remain central to a struggle of finding community is uh, the fact that like I am queer and I am like a brown queer person. Um, a lot of times means that there's degrees of understanding depending on the spaces that you're navigating, but the likelihood of finding like BIPOC, um, like queer people to exist in community with is, is low um, in a lot of spaces. And I say that look like zooming out of the larger community, like into the larger community as someone who lives in the Bay um, and recognizing that that's a very specific experience to be having. Um, and that's something that I reflect on as someone in uh, not like this space throughout high school. So I think for me and a lot of young folks, identity is a, is a huge like central component. Um, it could be from like many marginalized experiences, but for me, queerness and being brown and then recognizing at a fairly early age that I was starting to struggle with my mental health despite the fact that I was academically performing really well was uh, like the most interesting part of it, I think. And possibly like from my experience, an isolating experience because you're able to stay up and be able to show up in spaces um, with your full self. But it, upon reflection, that's not always the case. So I think identity-based and like performance-based um, challenges are probably the biggest barrier for my experience as to how you can find community that not only empathizes with your experiences, but like truly understands them. Um, but yeah, I think that that was at least for me throughout my high school experience and coming into college, something that's remained consistent, um, or I should say like ebbs and flows as you find community um, or learn how to communicate um, your needs as someone like coming into a space. 
And kind of stemming off of what Sin said, um, identity for me is big because um, I'm biracial, I'm black and white um, and Native American. And, you know, growing up, um, you know, you kind of feel like you're stuck in the middle. You know, I've had friends tell me, hey, you're not black because, you know, you sound a, you know, a certain way. And, you know, looking back on it, you know, I, I think those things definitely had an effect on me mentally to some degree. Um, but, you know, with ath me being a former Division One athlete, we um, really associate our identity with sport. Um, so people really struggle. Um, about 40% of athletes struggle transitioning out of sport um, when they graduate college. Um, so for me, I think identity is definitely, you know, a, a big challenge. Um, I agree with both of you. And for me, I think the biggest challenge in terms of fitting in is like the sense of being different from the people around you. So um, I have experienced a lot of situations where I wanted to fit in. Maybe like as an immigrant, I wanted to fit into this new country. And as a transfer student back in middle school, I wanted to fit into classes and have someone to sit with during lunch. And um, I don't want it to be viewed as like different. So it really affects my mental health because I'm constantly looking for this social approval. So I became like really focused on social media. I think getting more followers is like a sign of social approval. So, so during that period of time, I had like rapid mood swings. If people just like don't follow me back, I just get like this sense of failure and unworthy. And it really like has affected my academic performance overall and kind of like altered my altitude towards my family. So that's kind of like how it affects my mental health. Um, I guess I can kind of piggyback off of everybody being, well, going throughout my years of high school and even younger than that, my identity was always like the biggest marker like over top of my head throughout school because up until high school I predominantly went to um I was just the only black kid in my class pretty much until about eighth grade so it took a toll on me that I didn't realize until I got older and then I was still able to academically perform well I was top of my class freshman and sophomore year that I was slowly declining because I was trying to assimilate myself into what was the school culture at the time while still leaving pieces of what I've grown to know as myself and love. Thank you all for sharing each of your experiences. I can see people in our chat and listening are connecting with. I'm just appreciative of your vulnerability to share with us today. And I know many are connecting too. When we're thinking about this topic of, of finding a sense of belonging, finding a community, in your experience, when did you feel that greatest sense of community and connection? And maybe give us some details about that. Uh, I guess I'll start us off on that one. A good portion of, it was probably the later half of my freshman year. I had, it was some clubs, I swear, it's been so long, I can't remember. But it, it wasn't even like what the club was put down on paper for. It was honestly just a bunch of us who were into at the time, K-pop, K-pop, some of us, some of the boys were like into D&D. &D. It was like, we found our circle because most of us were considered like the outcast per se while at school for being into things that didn't fit in within the school norm. And once we all started to get to know each other more other than like our hobbies that ostracized us, we realized how much on a deeper level we all connected with each other. 
and that's when I knew I found my people per se and now we're all what a year or two out of high school and we still can't get rid of each other. Uh, for me, I felt the greatest sense of community and connection. Actually, when I founded my organization, um, you know, I, I was in a very difficult time. I felt um, alone, um, but I knew I wasn't the only one, only athlete that was dealing with mental health challenges. So uh, when I founded my organization, I did a lot of outreach to, um, there's a current former student athlete group um, in LinkedIn so I did a lot of my outreach uh, to current and former student athletes on LinkedIn, where, you know, we shared our mental health journeys. And, you know, that's when I really felt that sense of community, because then I knew I wasn't the only one um, that was alone. Yeah, I think for me, the hard like one of the hardest transitions up until this point of my life has been coming to college um and yeah throughout high school I felt like I had a very distinct and stable like friend group that you know I had fostered like I I think I like the way uh Anya was like bringing it up like it's a it was a bunch of us that didn't really make sense to be friends together like from an outside perspective but all together, like that was such a space of community care and mutual like investment in each other. Um, and I think for me, that was something that I was really afraid of losing when I came to college. And luckily, um, like I was able to find the co-op system that exists as like a housing structure here in Berkeley, um, where, you know, not only did it meet like my financial needs, but also it provided like a very different perspective to group housing um, where I was able to not only find students um, who are also low income like me or first gen, but also got to find friends that were kind of crossing like the barriers or limitations to what a lot of young people think like is a friend group. So I was able to find folks with similar experiences, whether it be coming from, um, like mixed status households or um, also being first gen students or also being queer or also Latina. And we almost like just found each other in this space. And the fact that I was experiencing not only traditional students, but non-traditional students, it opened my eyes to also like getting insight and support and guidance from your friends. And having a little bit more perspective on just the newness of everything that was coming at me uh, throughout my first year of college. Um, and I think that was like a great sense of connection because right off the bat, one of the things that they, they highly valued in this space was like active listening and being responsive to what someone was saying and being fully present in the conversations that you're having with someone. And I think that definitely changed like my perspective on how to navigate friendship in general throughout college, where um, I think a lot of young folks, um, it's hard to stay present in like a conversation or um, have consistent involvement with the folks that you're in community with. And navigating that where everyone is able to stay on the same page was something that I learned in this space and with these friends um, that now that we're scattered like all across the country and all across the world pretty much like that's something that has remained consistent and um, that sense of community is definitely rooted in care for each other and genuine investment in like the well-being of the people that you're around. Um, I also feel the greatest sense of community and connection when I'm like a part of this friend group. Um, it kind of like fulfills my need of belonging and I'm just like more confident as the person when I know that my friends are like standing next to me. And I just feel like everyone's opinions and words are like valued and being listened, listened when we're in this friend group. So yeah. Yeah, those are all really great. and. The common thread I think I'm hearing from all of you is finding a 
a group of individuals that have similar identities or interests and having that real genuine connection is when you feel the most comfortable and empowered. And that is so important, but it can be so hard to find as some of you had pointed out too. And especially during those transition points, whether it be transitioning from high school to college, from high school to the workplace, from school to school. I know Irene, you had talked about that earlier, coming in as maybe a new student in a new environment. And those transition periods can be really challenging. And especially for people that deal with mental health struggles as too, mental health struggles too. You know, if you have more anxiety or social anxiety, being in that new situation can be so difficult. And maybe finding that group can add challenges. And so something I kind of want to talk about next, and a lot of this discussion, you know, you're all talking about these groups that we can form. And, and as we get older, it becomes a little easier and not easier in the sense that it's easier for us to do, but we take more on ourselves to do it. But when we're thinking about youth at that younger age, maybe elementary school, maybe middle school, even into at some point high school, um, how can adults or organizations or schools help create that community between peers and spaces where they feel that they can fit in so that that can be taught and fostered at even a younger age to make kids feel more connected. I think um, one thing that schools and, and administration can think about doing is, um, you know, implementing clubs, um, you know, like, for example, if um, you know, there's a lot of um, LGBTQ students um, that identify with that community, maybe doing like an LGBTQ club or something like that. Or, you know, you're in a school that's, you know, 70% African-American. Well, maybe there should be some sort of like African-American, you know, club. I'm like a big believer in, you know, that community. And I think you know, the easiest way to implement something that's tangible is probably through through clubs. Yeah, I definitely agree with Marcus and that's what I also put down. So um, I think clubs, extracurriculars definitely helps with this sense of fitting in. And just like maybe schools could do like days throughout the year to promote equality or just like a sharing of culture. And I also feel like just generally like creating a more diverse community with like the involvement of like more BIPOC adults helps like for me seeing minority teachers in school really reduces my anxiety in terms of like fitting in in school and just to have like a more diverse student and faculty body also increases like my sense of belonging. Yeah, um, definitely like agree with everyone on on the importance of of affinity groups. And I think for me, um, I think zooming out is also like really helpful from like an adult organization or like school perspective and really seeing what can be like root causes for feeling displaced in your own community, um, which in itself should be a point of reflection. I feel like like what is happening in these spaces where students don't feel like they're at home or find safety. And I think a lot of it can be rooted in that, like a sense of security in a space. Um, because for me, a lot of times throughout high school, I remember navigating situations almost like in survival mode, like it prepared to have a fight or fight, fight or flight response, like prepared. And I think that that kind of like nervous system reaction is really intimately tied to things like anxiety, depression, like PTSD that we see in a lot of young folks. Um, and I think aside from that, spaces that value um, like intergenerational knowledge sharing is really important. So I think, you know, embedding, like Irene was mentioning, like staff that represents us and looks like us and has stories like us is really important. Uh, because it's also a degree of resilience that I get your I, that I feel young people are able to see, um, especially when they're struggling to find community or struggling to envision a future for themselves, is to see that 
there is something like on the other side, seeing that you can grow up is, is a very powerful tool for young, like brown folks and young black folks and young queer folks, considering how much like historical violence comes into play in our experiences in different spaces. Um, and I think also having like, as young people, a space where you're autonomous and able to have a say in what's happening is really impactful. So that's that's why I wholeheartedly agree with the like, like clubs on campus. Um, but also not only like as someone who was like in charge of clubs throughout high school, also genuinely having staff that is able to support students throughout their endeavors in, in club formation or club participation. Um, because yeah, there's definitely degrees of like experiences that come with being in that space, whether it's just you hanging out with like other people with your shared identities or really tackling the hard things. Like how do, how do you expect young folks to have a conversation on mental health amongst like other Latinas if they don't have the tools in their toolbox to be having that conversation? Um, there needs to, someone in the chat brought up mentorship. And I think that that's a crucial component of these organizations and spaces is, having that mentorship be a consistent pillar of someone's life to show that navigating community with folks your own age doesn't have to be the only way of navigating community. Um, and also having a say in that space and being able to determine like, what are we focusing on and being taken seriously in that, in that demand for a space that represents like the needs. Um, are a couple of things that I think would be really helpful for like adults and, and the environments that young people engage with, like to keep at the front of their mind. Um, just to kind of go off of what Brendan said and everyone pretty much, I agree heavily on the fact that clubs are an easier way to bridge in those kind of topics, whether or not it's a really hard talk, really hard topics about your specific affinity group or just being able to bond with other people who may have had shared experiences. But I think my main thing, which is something that's been also brought up, is staff, a staff school backing, even if it's not school staff, but like an adult presence within the club, because I can't speak on the college experience side, but in high school, if let's say like the person's like 15 and a bunch of other 15 year olds keep going at each other because they don't know how to sit down and start the conversation, then it's pretty much not gonna go anywhere without the adult that's able to give them the ideas and let them run with it. Yeah, wonderful points by all of you. And I really wanna, oh, Sandra, do you have something? Yeah, someone just brought up in the chat, like the challenge of carrying over this club um, experience into college that I just wanted to touch on really quickly, because that's a really like valid concern slash like worry or reality that a lot of young folks have some camp like obviously it, it fluctuates based on like the college campus but um, generally like as a parent or as someone who's involved in like the higher education space in some capacity, I would advocate for like continuous growth of resources, even if it's not a club, even if it's a support circle or a community event or something like that, there's almost more like the more options that are available to students, the more ways you can potentially catch folks who are falling through the cracks, the better. I think of like our university health services also having their own infrastructure of support spaces that work in conjunction with our clubs that are like run by students. So we have that overlapping system of support that's trying to catch students who need the more social component or need the more like clinical component of support. Um, and I think like advocating for that expansion of opportunities is is really important. So I appreciate like bringing that up because college is like really hard to navigate in just what degrees of community or how to manage time and all those different things come into play. Absolutely. And I think that can even be expanded to um, 
anyone who's post-graduation or in that transition time of finding spaces, even if it's not at a college campus, but within the community where you can fit in and find a sense of, of a group that you're able to connect with. I know even for myself, post-graduation and in so to say the real world, it is, you know, book clubs that I can connect with people who are reading similar things and having similar interests. Or, you know, if it's a group that we just want to, to walk and be able to talk in the meetings, things like that. And in the community, then volunteer opportunities and getting involved in your community and other people who have similar interests to better those around. There's so many opportunities for how we can connect. And I completely agree with Sin. It's continuing to advocate for those and expansion of those and resources for those. Um, and so that's a really great point. And thank you to whoever put that in the chat and bringing that up. I also just wanna emphasize everyone's point about the, the importance of staff and so to say teachers or mentors or club leaders that are representative of many different groups so people feel like they can belong and connect and that really brings up to the importance of that mentorship and that relationship and we know when looking at statistics with um, children who have adverse childhood experiences and aces some of those most important counter aces are supportive relationships and really those relationships grow and foster when it's someone that you can connect to and you can relate to and has gone through similar experiences that can help guide you down your path when you are young and needing that extra support. So thank you all for bringing that up. It's a really great point. One thing that, that we have been talking about too so much is um, the intersections of identity and how that fits into feeling like you're fit in, fitting in. And we know that individuals who are BIPOC often report greater mental health concerns than their peers, and even at those young ages. And our research shows that having those supportive environments and positive relationships are crucial for maintaining that really good mental health. So how can community members, and we've talked about this a little bit, any other ideas you wanna bring into the discussion of how community members can specifically support BIPOC youth, whether that be in a school setting, in a community setting or parents? One idea that I have um, kind of stems down to funding. I think personally, there needs to be more funding going towards uh, BIPOC um, initiatives. Um, you know, the BIPOC community is obviously very underserved. Um, so, you know, a lot of capital is not really going towards those types of initiatives. So I think we really need to make that a priority moving forward. I also feel like just by like incorporating more cultures and different perspectives in the curriculum will make like BIPOC youth feel like they're represented in like school setting. Yeah, I can go too. Um, I think uh, the ways that we can support like BIPOC like youth is definitely like variable to the degree of support that's being asked for. Um, and I agree that like, ultimately the infrastructure that like we're working with doesn't, isn't created with the image to support us. Um, and I think that that's like fundamentally like where our conversation inevitably has to go is the fact that these like systems that we're working in weren't really envisioned with us, like people like us to succeed in them. and. I think even that acknowledgement can do a number on one's mental health. Um, but I think that's also why like folks who are like non by POC folks or elders in the community or young folks like this is like, it needs to be an intersectional approach to show support. Um, and I think like the best way I can say this is like to genuinely be there when the going gets rough. Like I think most closely to, 2020 and how much solidarity was illustrated around 
um, like George, the murder of George Floyd or at the start of COVID when uh, folks were showing like solidarity amongst um, like the attacks um, motivated by like Asian hate. But where has that kind of gone now? Like, I wonder where that has that energy has gone. And I think that's also part of this mental health conversation for young folks of color is showing that you're not there just in crisis time, but to actually sustain wellness and invest in the long game, as opposed to like, what do we do this month to make sure you're okay? Um, and I think this is like an ongoing conversation in all of healthcare, but having like historically and culturally competent care is like really important. Um, and I think that high schools are genuinely like understaffed um, to provide this. And I think that's also why I emphasize like like funding for this um, because we can't expect folks who don't know how to do this kind of work to do this work. Um, and I think another part is illustrating or like being cognizant of the fact that like mental health is a constant um not something that just exists in greatness or in like absolute like distress um and acknowledge the kind of barriers that make mental health wellness harder for young folks of color um because sometimes all it takes is like someone sitting there with you through the hard times or sometimes it's someone walking you to the emergency room or sitting there while you're on like a hotline and navigating all of that with grace and understanding that you know also historical and cultural conversations around mental health are going to inhibit the way we talk about mental health and it's not going to look the same for like all marginalized folks but understanding that these conversations are hard for us to have because we're deconstructing whatever has like come before us and whatever knowledge has been passed down or limitations to what you should share about your mental health and I think like checking one's own biases too is a really important component to support like BIPOC mental health because you know as we have like this huge advocacy movement for taking days off for your mental health and stuff like what does that actually look like in application if a black or brown student is to do that are we gonna see them as lazy or they don't care about their education or they're just trying to get out of an assignment or something, or are we genuinely gonna see that this is someone taking care of their like health? Um, and I don't think that same standard exists for non-BIPOC students or BIPOC folks in general. Um, so I think acknowledging and having that conversation with yourself and your peers um, to ensure kind of a genuine approach to care is also really important. Thank you all. Um, we can move on to our next question. You all just had the most wonderful insights there, so I appreciate it. Um, I know we've talked quite a bit about challenges, so I'm gonna move past that one if you're following me on our list. But um, I next wanna kind of go into opportunities for creating these environments because every individual is so different. We all have different interests, hobbies, things we value, pieces of our identities. And so as we've talked about today, that important piece of the puzzle is connecting with youth that have similar interests or have similar identities or have similar hobbies. And that's really when that magic of connection happens. And so what opportunities do you see for creating or supporting unique ways of connection that might be beyond our traditional ways of, you know, joining this board or joining this club? Or where can we intersect mental health into different spaces that we might not be in? I know it's a challenge. Well, while you all think, I'm gonna hop to Marcus first because Marcus has um, a really amazing and interesting organization where he's created a way to connect youth um, 
with a similar interest. He brought mental health into sports. And so for those athletes that, that are, you know, whether it be a few years or lifelong athletes, he has talked about that transition time and being difficult. And a lot of times when we think of sports or, you know, you're going to join a team that that's not necessarily where you're going to talk about mental health, but really those are the spaces where it's needed. So I just want to open it up to Marcus to tell us about how you came up with this approach and how you saw the need for it and really how integrating mental health into that athletic space has worked. Yeah, great question, Jackie. Um, yeah, for me, um, like I mentioned, it was um, a very dark time uh, for me about three years ago. Um, I felt very alone in my journey, but I knew I wasn't the only one. Um, so. I really wanted to ha feel that sense of community and connect with others like myself. Um, so during the pandemic, I reached out to about 5,000 student athletes. I spoke to about 500 people, give or take, where, you know, we shared our stories together to really, you know, connect around, you know, athlete mental health. And then, um, you know, the pandemic happened and, you know, outside of the pandemic, um, you know, the the elections um, and mental health um, sports was a big topic because, you know, sports, you know, were, were canceled for, you know, a short period of time. So I think, um, you know, with the discussions of sports being canceled and and mental health being at the topic uh, or the forefront, um, you know, for for the country, I think it really presented a unique opportunity to start connecting, you know, with athletes. So, um, you know, that later turned into people wanting internships with my organization, which was very humbling. And um, we had an intern a couple summers ago um, that was able to interview um, professional athletes, Olympic athletes, where they came on to our social media platform and, you know, shared their stories. And I think there's a lot of power in that because you have these young athletes that aspire to, you know, play professionally and seeing those professional athletes be vulnerable, um, you know, in their stories, I think will help instill confidence um, in the next generation of athletes. So essentially what my organization is really revolved around um, is connecting athletes to um, qualified mental health uh, professionals because majority of providers don't accept insurance. So that means um, for one hour long session, a person's paying anywhere from 60 to $250 per session. Um, and 48% of people don't know if they qualify for mental health services and nearly as many don't know how to access those services. So I hope with my foundation, we can essentially solve that issue for the student athlete population by connecting them to qualified mental health um, professionals, but also being able to pay for their services um, as well. Absolutely. It is so great to see the work that you're doing in these spaces where it's so needed. And, you know, there are stigma in so many areas of life. And I feel, and correct me if you feel differently, Marcus, but for so many years, there was such a competitive focus on sports that mental health wasn't taken care of. And now we're really seeing athletes, like you had talked about, some of those professional athletes be more vulnerable and have those conversations. And then we have people like you who are doing the work to bring that to sports at even a younger age with, with individuals. And it's just really great to see. So thank you for the work that, that you're doing in this kind of new and creative space. It's really awesome to see. And I'll leave it open if anyone else wants to add. I had two different spaces that I think like but like building off of like what Marcus was saying or like that kind of sparked these like non-conventional spaces of talking about mental health. Um, I definitely like appreciate all that he's done to like as a young athlete, like having something like this would have been really helpful to know about. Um, for Unfortunately, we connected after I left high school, but, you know, um, I think other spaces that would be really helpful to have conversations out, out in the open or or just have more infrastructure around connectivity um, and openness to mental health conversations are within our like science, technology, like engineering and like math spaces, like our STEM spaces on college campuses or even 
especially actually in high school spaces um, where there's this pipeline of, of academia at the forefront. And I think that a lot of times it's seen that your profession and your mental health exists separately from each other or your academic interest and your mental health exists separately from each other. And I think having more infrastructure that supports um, marginalized students in STEM as well is like a wildly like under um, underdeveloped space for mental health and mental wellness and uh, can also be a very isolating space where um, that same conversation around like your professional endeavors takes precedent over like your mental health. So, you know, yes, you can be feeling very anxious that day, but you also have to make sure you turn in this lab on time. Like there's there's kind of degrees of priority that come into place. And um, I think another space or like a way that can foster connectivity and, and openness to mental health conversations is like embracing identity spaces and embracing um, the kind of indigenous thought that kind of has given precedent to mental wellness and community communication around your wellness. Um, I think of like restorative justice circles or community building circles that serve as like in that indirect, really strong tools for mental health, um, all of which are like rooted in indigenous practice. And um, a large part of mental health now is I see this fight or this struggle against the commercialization of mental health. And I think these two spaces let you genuinely take care of one's mental health and like even go so far as to advocate for like communal um, health. And if you're working in community for these things, that connection will hopefully come with time as well. Absolutely. Any other thoughts on that one? Thank you both. Um, I want to emphasize to what Sin had said about that community healing, and that can be so beneficial and important. And for adults that are looking for ways to help create these spaces, that might be something that you can look into is how can we create community spaces where we are working through healing and processing and talking with with individuals. And while, you know, that might look different as youth get older and are able to process through more of that, there's a lot we can even do with kids at a young age starting to talk about mindfulness and other types of practices that they can they can work through to start to be able to identify emotions and identify how they're feeling and then what to do with that and how to communicate that. And fostering that at a young age then allows them to be able to communicate that better as they get older. And it becomes more of a normal practice rather than having to learn it later in life. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. And um, one of the last webinars, I can't remember if it was the last or before this, we did have someone on who, who um, hosts those Indigenous healing circles. And it's just so wonderful that those are out and available for, for people that can really connect to and heal in those settings. And so that, that sense of community and our healing is so important too. So thank you, Sin. And thank you, Marcus, for talking on the work that, that you do as well. I want, I have a few things, I know we're getting close to our hour, but a few last things for us to discuss. Um, just some, some real tangible items that people can leave with. If say someone's listening to us here today in our discussion and they're connecting with that feeling of struggle of finding a space that they might fit into what advice would you give to that young person uh, if i could give um someone or anyone uh advice it would probably be to find people that uh, may look like you or find people that you know share similar interests. Um, you know, I think for me that's what I found to work the best. Um, so, you know, you know, with our struggles, you know, finding people that 
can, you know, you can relate to, to, you know, kind of have that peer support, um, I think is definitely, um, you know, some advice I would, I would give the next generation. Um, I'd have to agree with my piece on that one, going throughout some personal issues within high school. Um, peer on peer support was a big thing for me because I know like the usual things to find like a trusted adult to sit down and talk with, but a lot of the adults in Unfortunately, in some school situations, they're literally stretched so thin like a rubber band that they don't know how to handle themselves to be able to have to help you with your situation. So you just pretty much like zip it and don't say anything because the person you're meant to talk to doesn't know how to assist you. So peer on peer and I think that really helps a lot of younger people throughout high school and into the college age. Um I think for me my advice would just be like be yourself. Because um, I was like struggling to fit in in middle school because I don't have any common topics to talk to, to like people around me. And I was like pretending that we have the same interests just, just to like try to like fit into their group. But like after entering high school, I, I mean like the one in middle school apparently doesn't work out. Um, so after entering high school, I don't really care about like whether or not I will fit in. I'm like ex expressing like myself and my real interests. And this actually like allow me to make friends with like common interests and idea. So I think just like generally just like be yourself would be like my advice. Yeah. And I also like remember this feeling like very vividly. Um, and I think knowing that you deserve to be like in community and like you're worthy of like having folks care about you or invest in like your own joy or have other people invested in your own joy is you deserve it. Like it's should be top of priority. It should be top of mind. And if you're struggling to find it now, like it's also like going to come around eventually. And the frustration and like the heartache that comes from it, like that too will pass. Um, and just know that you deserve to have a space where you feel like comfortable and safe. Um, and if you're not there yet, it's coming. <laughs> uh, this is slightly half off of what Tim said. Like, I, all of the, I understand all of those feelings of frustration they suck they suck so hard right now but as time goes on it does it sounds so corny to some people but things you are able to figure out things better as you progress in life but it's i understand how sucky is how hard it is to look forward and realize that it's that it will figure itself out at some point but always just trying to keep that in the back of your head Absolutely. Thank you all for those insights. I know for a lot of kids, they can feel like they are the only ones who are experiencing that. And I think at some point, all of us have felt that way. When you are feeling out of place, or you are feeling anxious, or you are feeling sad or depressed, or like you don't have friends or people that really understand you, it's easy for our youth to think that they're the only ones going through that. And that's another thing is, you know, as adults, we can remind them, this is hard for everyone. This is not an easy time. And, you know, like what was said by so many of you, it, it's looking forward to get past that and providing space and opportunity to help get to that next point. 
And so that's going to lead into our very last question. I know we're getting close here, but quickly, um, if I know we have a lot of supportive adults that are on the call, whether um, they are clinicians in the mental health space, teachers, parents, um, those working with youth in, in organizations or nonprofits, for any of the adults that are listening and recognizing that there might be a youth that's struggling with those feelings um, and struggling with their mental health or struggling to feel connection, how do you suggest the adults listening can help get that youth connected? Uh, I'm a big um, advocate for youth mental health first aid training, which teaches, um, you know, individuals that work with youth, the foundations of depression, anxiety, psychosis, substance use, and eating disorders, and it also equips them with a mental health action plan to help um, those that are um, struggling with mental health crisis. So I personally think that um, all coaches, parents, and administration should consider getting trained in some sort of mental health first aid training or QPR training. I think seeing this like new wave of communication through like social media or online platforms needs to be at the forefront of um, like the generations before us seeing it as a legitimate way of community care and self-care um uh, especially when it's like one of your only tools in your toolbox to navigate a hard situation i think coming someone mentioned in the chat but coming in and listening to young folks with an open mind especially in this regard as to how we're using um the internet as a tool um for multiple things not even just mental health but um, also seeing that this is a lot of times where we find community and identity based community um, that we can't find sometimes in our physical spaces kind of helps us navigate our mental health and our mental wellness in a way that doesn't have like geographical or socioeconomic or um, like so many other barriers that exist in the physical space um, and open up what's possible for us. Wonderful. Any last thoughts on that one? Thank you all. Well, I just want to say thank you to everyone who has been joining us and thank you to our panelists. We really appreciate you for being here. Um, uh, just a few reminders as we wrap up, we will be sending out um, some follow up in the next few days that will be the recording of this if you would like to rewatch or share. There will also be that link to request your certificate of attendance, as well as our um, link for the back to school toolkit that has resources and information on a lot of the topics that were discussed here today. So please utilize that and share with others. Thank you all for joining us and for your vulnerability, your openness, and your great insights. I just appreciate every one of you and for all of those who joined us. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon and have a good rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.